This is the third mini lecture on chapter one. We are addressing the learning objective here of identifying the good, the bad, and the ugly of e-learning, and we'll discuss some promises and pitfalls of e-learning. The promises include customized instruction, engagement, and learning, and multimedia, and acceleration of expertise. So starting with customized instruction, very simple version of this is the instruction asks a question and if the student gets it right you move on the system moves on to the next topic if they get it incorrect there's some review of the content related to that question very simple but quite powerful approach to uh, adapting instruction of the review kind to the needs to the demonstrated needs of students a richer form of adaptive instruction is in intelligent tutoring systems and they adapt at many different time scales within a task there can be adaptation to different student solution paths and different errors so that instruction is provided just when needed and in the context of the student's particular solution to a problem or their particular struggles with uh, particular common errors for example there's also adaptations that can happen between tasks or within the course overall as the system adapts to how different students might be taking different learning paths or proceeding at different rates through uh, the content and thereby the system can adapt instruction by selecting tasks that are appropriate to each individual student's needs. Finally, and perhaps most powerfully, e-learning can be updated between course instances by using data from the course to adapt the common challenges that students are facing. The model of learners can be updated and new tasks can be created as well as parameters that drive these adaptive algorithms like uh, how fast do which knowledge components change over time. Those can be adjusted based on that data. This last thing was certainly an important part of the methods we'll talk about in the course and the data component in the big picture diagram we've been discussing. Here's an example of an intelligent tutor based on cognitive psychology research, our own algebra cognitive tutors. This is a unit on systems of equations. And in many of these units, students are presented with authentic problem scenarios, like comparing these two different cell phone plans that have different per month charges and different per minute charges. And they're working through a set of questions here by filling in this table that starts off empty. And as they're making entries in here, they'll get implicit positive feedback when it's correct. The tutor will just highlight with a color change typically that they've got it right. Or when they got it wrong, they might get this uh, a little indicator here that they can roll over to get immediate feedback. So the student forgot the uh, 1495 uh, intercept in this, the, the monthly charge just has the per minute charge. So that's feedback on errors. When they're addressing challenging questions, they might need a hint. They might find that the prior instruction they received, um, they're not able to recall what's appropriate in this context. So they can get instruction that is contextualized, personalized to their own needs in the context of the problem to help answer challenging questions. And so that's, the, that's that uh, task within task adaptation from the previous slide. Between tasks, this model that's being built of students' acquisition of different skills it can be used to select the next task or just determine when the student's done with this particular unit because they've mastered all the skills. What the skills are and how fast these bars should change based on performance, those are both things that data can be used to improve in the outermost adaptation cycle in the previous graph between course instances using data. A second promise of e-learning is in terms of how it engages learning. And one way to think about that is in terms of how being more learner-centered and having learners actually do something right in the interface and get feedback can help them stay engaged, right? The activity and the feedback can help them um, and, you know, and especially in an asynchronous kind of learning setting when they're on their own, getting that kind of interaction can keep students engaged. Now, of course, just because they are interacting where their behavior is high doesn't mean they're thinking in a way that's going to lead to learning. So in this engagement matrix from the book, 
we are looking to achieve high psychological activity that will enhance learning, right? And that's up here. That's what we want from our learners. But here's what we see. What we see is their behavior. And what can happen sometimes is that we can mistake what looks like learning for what isn't down here, or what looks like disengagement, but actually is learning up here. So let's expand that a little bit. So in this cell, we have something that's high in behavioral activity. So it looks like stuff's going on, but low in psychological activity. So there's not really learning going on. Can you think of an example of that? You might stop the video and try to generate an example for yourself. One version of this we see in e-learning is what's been referred to as gaming the system, where the student's just guessing. So imagine when you're doing OLI, you might be tempted sometimes to just click in the options in a multiple choice question until you get feedback that you get it right. That looks as you're acting. In fact, you might be acting at a very fast rate, but not engaging in the kind of psychological activity that's intended where there's the right instructional event, but the wrong learning event occurring. How about here? Um, this is a case where we have low behavioral activity. It might look like the student's disengaged, but in fact, they are thinking deeply. What's an example of that? Again, you can stop and think of one. Here's one. The student is studying a worked example. You know, they're reading through it, right? Um, and they're mentally trying to come up with an explanation for each step. Why is this step here? And then maybe going back to prior textbook pages to say, well, what principle was I taught previously or a theorem or a rule that applies in, in this situation that would lead to, why is that minus sign there, for example? So we'll talk uh, later about principles of studying worked examples and students self-explaining. And we can make that the self-explaining part at least more active or behavioral by asking students to report an explanation. But you can often find good learners who are not, are only doing it in their head. And so the behavioral activity is low, but high psychological activity. These differences here make the learning design challenging, and that's why we need data to help us. The last two promises are multimedia and acceleration of expertise through scenarios. We'll, we'll be talking a lot about multimedia in the later part of the course. The computer media is great for allowing us to incorporate uh, graphics uh, as well as text to have animations that you can play um, that might have audio overlay. So you can use these different elements, visual, verbal, sound in different ways to enhance performance. It is also possible to build out more complex scenarios, simulations, richer problem scenarios like we saw with the algebra tutor uh, earlier, and work students through a, a richer set of problem solving activities, high in variability toward farther transfer by having them have more realistic uh, experiences. There are pitfalls of e-learning, um, and, and we'll discuss review from the textbook these four. Too much of a good thing uh, refers to situations where there's a lot of extra irrelevant content. So this is a unit on you know, how ammunition works, probably for military training. Um, there's some relevant stuff down here, but there's this picture over here that's not relevant, and there's some video popping up over the main content. A lot of visual noise, basically, but then some literally audio noise in this implemented thing where there are bullet sounds and bomb blasts. This is going to be a cognitive overload for students and going to distract them from the content that you want them to learn. We'll discuss related principles called the coherence principle and the redundancy principle later in this course that avoid too much of a good thing. Not enough of a good thing in situations like this wall of text where we're not using any uh, graphics or audio capabilities. Um, there's a lot of abstract words and few examples. And so again, later we'll have principles like the multimedia principle that suggests good use of pictures along with words. And then sometimes the words should be in audio. That's the modality effect uh, versus in text. Also things like incorporating worked examples. 
Losing sight of the goal is another one of these pitfalls that you want to try to avoid. Notice here the learning goal is using spreadsheets in your small business. And then this instruction on, in this unit in the course introduction is going essentially on a tangent about the history of spreadsheets. Might be interesting, but if you really want to help students achieve this goal effectively, this instruction is uh, distracting to that goal. It might be part of a different goal, like learn about the history of spreadsheets, but in this case, this instruction is not well aligned with the goal. And when we talk about methods of backward design, we'll be talking about how you can think more systematically about what are the goals and how is the instruction, as well as the assessments, how are they aligned to those goals. Finally, uh, another pitfall is you know, it's great to have students engaged in some activity and if they can discover new knowledge, that's super. But what happens in a discovery-oriented environment like this one where learners are asked in this case to explore the environment to discover facts about the new product? What happens when they don't discover those things? If there's no guidance in the system, they're unlikely to learn those things, right, if they never come across them. So you need some way of guiding the learner, uh, peer discovery in environments, uh, especially amongst more novice students to little learning because they, they never get the appropriate information that they need. So popping back up, chapter one, we covered these four, three um, learning objectives, and you can go back to the previous videos, but also take the quiz and see how your learning is going and test your learning. Come back here if you get some questions wrong and, and want to review some of this material.